is Kent Hance, a best storyteller in Texas. Saying of the day, the young man knows the rules and the old man knows the exceptions. Oliver Wendell Holmes said that. Um, we're going to have probably in the next few weeks an interview I did with Senator Ted Cruz. And these interviews I do are to find out how they got where they are and a little about their background. Uh, his political, he's, he's conservative Republican, but most people know his political positions. And when I interview, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, I try to find out who they are and something about them and how they got where they are now. And so whether you like or dislike his positions, you ought to listen to the interview. It's really good. Uh, talks about his dad being in prison in, in Cuba uh, for fighting for freedom and that how his parents met and how uh, he uh, has gotten where he is and how he got the clerk for the chief justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. There are not many people fall in the category that they're smart enough and good enough lawyers that they'll clerk for the Supreme Court justice, chief justice. And he's got some funny stories on how he got that job. So look forward to seeing uh, what we'll be having in the next few weeks on uh, Senator Ted Cruz. We've got others coming up that uh, just interviews about who they are, how they got where they are. I think you'll enjoy it. Something new I wanted to mention, uh, we have a uh, HancePodcast.com, and that's new, and it's HancePodcast.com. Easy to get to. It has a library of all the episodes, and also we have uh, an email, and that's info at HancePodcast.com. Info, I-N-F-O, at HancePodcast.com. And if, you know, if you're one of my classes, you want me to tell some story I've told in the class, or, or if you want to if you want to give me the material for a new story, uh, be sure and put in there if you want your name used or not used. You know, I had a guy send me a suggestion. He said, do not use this with my name. My ex might listen to it, you know, so he, he was a little concerned. But if you uh, uh, want to contact us, it's uh, the email's info at hancepodcast.com. So uh, look forward to hearing from you and, and always enjoy suggestions. Um, the average person, I was reading this this week, they have 2,795 pictures in their cell phone. One of the reasons they have so many phones, they don't delete, uh, they have so many pictures, they don't delete a lot of the pictures. And if you'll go back and look at your phone, sometimes you'll have five pictures in a row that are the same. You clicked them, clicked them, you didn't go back and delete them. Uh, that uh, supposedly six times a day you'll take a picture. Now, I, I don't, I won't average six a day, I don't think. Uh, they will take pictures to show a point or that they're funny, or to put on Twitter, or TikTok, or whatever. Uh, But uh, they delete very few. A survey uh, recently uh, asked people the number one thing they went to the gym for, and uh, abs. They want better abs. They don't want that fat stomach. Uh, The other thing, they want their arms and legs to be more muscular. And also, I saw a deal that uh, on a to-do list, all of us, or I do, and I think most people do, uh, some on, uh, are written, others are just mentally to-do lists, things you must do or you need to do. And they did a survey of people, and there are people, and mostly young people, that will la- add something to their to-do list that they've already done because they want to get the satisfaction of marking it off. And for those that were uh, 65 and older, only 25% will add something. But if they're 45 and below, at least 50% will add something they've already done so they can get the satisfaction of of marking it off. Uh, We also have uh, today, and I've got some sound bites on this, a stupid criminal. Uh, Some criminal stole a shop vac, one of these high-powered vacuum cleaners, that they'll use uh, around shops and places like that. And a lot of your uh, exterminators use them for bees and hornets and things like that. 
and there was a exterminator in Philadelphia, and some people had some hornets in their house, and he went out and removed it, and then he used that shop back to suck all those hornets out of the air. And probably had several hundred, and someone stole that out of his truck, and uh, he he had a funny funny thing to say about it. I've joked for years that, you know, I don't need to lock my vehicle. And the bees and wasps afford a certain degree of a, a, a bit of a safety net. Yeah, th- this is one where of all the vacuums in all the trucks that they could have grabbed, they, I think they grabbed the wrong one. What a big mistake. Wonder what's in there, you know, opening. Say they stole it and got in the car. You know, if they stole it and got in the car, I mean, just wonder they wouldn't have a bad wreck. The thief was not a smart thief, but... You know, if they were smart, they wouldn't be stealing it. So, you know, they're going to get caught on that one. We also had a story out of the state of Washington uh, in Seattle that someone took a a Halloween mask and put it on the headrest of a car and then a raincoat wrapped around the seat. It wouldn't fool anybody that looked at it. They glanced, they might not, you know, and of course, they got a fine, and the fines range from one hundred and fifty dollars to three fifty. And you know, they had the lawsuit not long ago where a woman in in uh, uh, Plano she was pregnant, so she said that, that she had two people, and she ought to be able to get in the you know H O V lane. And uh, I, I think it's a hard argument to win, but uh, she. Uh, uh, was trying it anyway, and the case is on appeal. So we'll see what happens on that. But a Halloween mask is not going to fool anyone. So, you know, steer away from that. Uh, TikTok, you know, I, I, TikTok's everywhere now. And a lot of people say don't use it, and the Chinese get your information and everything like, uh, like that. And uh, they give out a lot of nutritional advice. And uh, a couple of the large newspapers written they did a study on it and a lot of it's just bad advice and it's not good nutritional advice but you know i I go back to john daly john daly was the golfer and uh he went to arkansas on a golf scholarship they told him if he didn't lose down to 190 by january he wasn't going to play on the team And so he went on a diet of whiskey and cigarettes and, uh, he, and he, he made it, made it down to 188 and that he is sitting around the night that they weighed him and everything. And they were celebrating and drinking whiskey and smoking cigarettes. And somebody said, John, you you ought to write a book on how to lose weight, you know, get you a diet book. Uh, You can go to a bookstore and there are more diet books. And I wonder how many get the books and don't ever read them or, or don't read them very long, and they move along. For those of you that follow golf and are watching the Ryder Cup, uh, Texas Tech uh, ex-alum uh, uh, Ludwig Atberg, uh, he is uh, playing for the Europeans. He's, he's from Sweden, uh, was a great golfer uh, for Texas Tech, and, and uh, he uh, gives us a little shout-out. Uh, at, uh, at after his first round. But he, he played well, and uh, he is an outstanding young man. Here's Ludwig at the press conference. If I owe a lot to the PGA Tour U program, I owe uh, a lot more to Texas Tech University. Um, I feel like they gave me the opportunities to come over to the States, play practice. Um, we play a really good schedule. We play you know good um, preparing golf courses. So, I would recommend anyone who's considering going to college to do so. Always happy to see uh, anyone in the Red Raider family doing well and uh, certainly acknowledge all the others in Texas or around the country that uh, do well and uh, recognize their colleges as well. Another story came out uh, was about Blockbuster. And it, for those of you who are old enough, you know, Blockbuster, I mean, you could go. I, I had a house in Dallas, and on the weekend we'd, go get a movie, and, I mean, you couldn't get a parking space. And uh, everybody's in Blockbuster, and Blockbuster had a, a big building downtown Dallas, and they had, like, 20-something floors. They were rolling. And Netflix met with them, and they were trying to merge and, 
that, that Netflix was having a bad time. This is a personal story. I had a guy come to me in 99, and he had some Netflix stock, and he offered to sell it to me for a million dollars. He had a million shares, dollar a share. Well, you know, I mean, I, I just thought that it wasn't going to, wasn't going to make it. And, uh, and uh, I think back, uh, you know, it's around 400 and something a share now. <laughs> so, hell, I might not be doing the podcast. Might just be sorry, no good, and living on an island somewhere. Now, I wasn't the only one who thought that Netflix uh, wasn't probably going to make it. Uh, here's a clip from Mark Randolph, uh, the CEO, and uh, tells about their meeting uh, between Netflix and Blockbuster and how things did not work out uh, well or a blockbuster. We kind of make our pitch to them. They go, we think there is great synergy here. We could run your online business. You'd run the stores. This would be a great combination. But they finally said, so what do you think we should pay for you? And I remember, what he goes like, $50 million. I swear they were all kind of holding a laugh in because they found that so ridiculous. I remember sitting there going, oh, God, now we're going to have to kick their ass. You know what the best part is? <laughs> you know what the best part is. We did. That's the best part. Well, the $50 million that uh, they wanted to pay, you know, it would have been worth billions. And, uh, but uh, Blockbuster was, you know, a little arrogant, I guess, and thought that no one could touch them. And the result was they got destroyed. Any business you're in in this day and time, with technology and inventions and research and development, uh, you, you got to be on top of it all the time and, and looking down the road on what's going to happen. But uh, that was one of the failures of a large company that, uh, you know, everybody thought that it, it would never have a bad day. But someone's going to come along and invent something that will uh, make you obsolete. That's what happened to Blockbuster. This week I wanted to talk about uh, Alfred Nobel or noble, as some people say. He uh, was uh, originally from Sweden. He spoke seven languages. He had a stroke before he died. And after he had the stroke, he could only speak Swedish. And he lost the others. But he spoke He spoke uh, German, English, French, Italian, uh, Spanish, Swedish and something else. I'm leaving something out, you know, if there's anything left. Uh, but he was a smart young man. His dad recognized he had a lot of talent, and he sent him to be an apprentice with a chemist, a well-known chemist in uh, France. And he came up and invented nitroglycerin and dynamite and made a lot of money off of it. And, you know, the dynamite was used – the Panama Canal, uh, to, to dig the canal, uh, that they were able to blow things up and, and uh, move it, uh, move the dirt a lot easier. And he uh, was living in France, and his brother Ludwig was in the uh, south of France and died. And they got it mixed up, the reporter did, and report that Alfred died. And they called him the merchant of death and talked about he invented, invented things that were used in war like dynamite and nitroglycerin. And, of course, they used peacetime also. Well, he didn't like that. And so one of the things he did was to go back and uh, try to figure out how do I remedy that image that I'm not the merchant of death. So he came up with a Nobel Peace Prize. And, uh, you know, the Nobel Peace Prize used to be a big deal. It's kind of gotten, they were so happy that Obama won. They gave him the, the Peace Prize, like, within two weeks after he'd gone in. He hadn't had a chance to do anything. They, they uh, have a very left slant to it, but uh, they give the Nobel Peace Prize in several areas, and that's because he didn't want to be known as the merchant of death. He, uh, as I said earlier, he had several strokes, but uh, one of them caused him to lose the ability to speak language except uh, Swedish. After that happened, he was in France, and he, he said it was very difficult uh, to be living uh, in assisted nursing 
when you didn't speak their language and they didn't speak yours. And he, he wrote extensively about failure to have the language of where you are and what a disadvantage it puts you at. And this was a smart guy. He lived to be 63, but he did a lot in his 63 years. In closing, I just want to remind you that we will have, uh, in the next few weeks, interview with uh, Ted Cruz, U.S. Senator from Texas, and uh, about how he got where he is in his career. We're going to have several of these, uh, and we're trying to get Republicans and Democrats, and talk about how they got where they are. Not so much, you, you know their positions on things, and, and that's all over the Internet, uh, but... How did they get to be a U.S. senator? Or how did they get to be solicitor general for the state of Texas? And uh, I think you'll find them very interesting. But the uh, saying of the day was the young man knows the rules, but the old man knows the exceptions to the rules. And that's very good. Oliver Wendell Holmes said that. Ken Hance, best storyteller in Texas. <laughs>